I'm Jessica Roberts, your board president for APBP, and I want to start by saying that um, as a member of your board, uh, as a longtime APBP member, but maybe most importantly as someone who lives and works here in Portland, it has been such a joy to see you all participating in this conference in Portland. I've seen you out and about at various mobile tours. My husband and son texted me on Monday saying, we just saw a walking APBP walking tour in, in uh, Pioneer Square. Uh, it's been really fun to see you all on Twitter, hashtag fresh Kermit all over the place, um, some of you jumping in the river, uh, and most of all, of course, it's been fun to see you meet each other. So whether you're um, finally putting a, a, you know, meeting the famous Peters, Firth, and Koontz, or whether it's meeting people who are confronting similar challenges to those that you have, or maybe people who have some solutions or ideas for you. Uh, as I said on Sunday night, the entire reason we're here is to learn from each other, learn with each other, and create relationships that we'll take home with us that help us make great places where people can walk and bike. And that's what APBP is all about. So with that, I'm officially calling to order our annual business meeting, um, which we try to make have uh, value mostly for you. So hopefully by the end, uh, if you are a longtime APBP member, you'll feel a renewed sense of what we're working on. And if this is an organization that, that's new to you, I hope you hear some things that, um, that you like and that can help you do your job. So let's start. I want to get a read on who's in the room. Um, so can you raise your hand if you are from the public sector in some way? Oh, yeah. That's a dang lot of you. That's great that your agencies gave you permission to come and travel budget. Good job. Uh, who's from the private sector? Great. Lots, uh, lots of that. Um, what about students? Great. Thank you so much for coming. We've really enjoyed all of your posters and uh, uh, learning about your research. And, and also, speaking of, how about researchers? Yeah, that's a, that's a newer focus area for us, really wanting to make sure that researchers can, can find a good community in APBP to connect with each other and, uh, of course, with the practitioners that they serve. Um, if I didn't call out your particular classification, please raise your hand. Advocates, please raise your hand. Wonderful. Oh, look how many there are. So as you can see, in many ways, this is a pretty big tent, and we want to keep it that way and, and make it bigger and better uh, to benefit uh, all of us. Um, so uh, this is also the part of, this, of the Oscar speech where you list all the many people that you have to thank, of course. So this conference has been several years in the making, and um, the Portland planning team, local host committee, have put in tons of time. I want to call all your names. Please stand and remain standing. Uh, let's hold our applause to the end because there are so many of them. Uh, so Tom Bertulis, um, this is the moment where we find out who partied last night, uh, Jeremy Charzan, Paul Comery, Camilla Dartnell, Dana Dickman, Catherine Doherty Chapman, Marnie Duke, Nick Falbo, Renata Frantum, Aaron Galinas, Tyler Golly, Anna Gore, Hal Hagedorn, Kate Hartley, Jesse Holzer, Tony Hall, Michael King, Marianne Coos, Sarisha Kathuri, Brenda Martin, Nathan McNeil, Greg Raceman, Byron Rushing, one of you's gonna stand up, Gwen Shaw, Rayleigh Stark, Melissa White, and Jessica Zadeb. Thank you all. And I, I, I held back for a special thank you. Are Kate McCusker and Peter Kuntz here this morning? So Kate is our local host chair, and Peter is our sponsorship chair. And they put in countless hours and, and such a terrific level of leadership. We are so grateful to them. And com compared to a lot of conferences, uh, we take pretty seriously the mobile tour part because it's great to you know, look at slides and do the geometric design, but there's nothing like seeing actually in the field how things were done, talking to the actual engineer or planner who made that come into existence. So uh, anyone who helped to organize a mobile tour, will you stand? Okay, well, they're all out mobile touring, but they did a great job, so we'll just in absentia. And um, I also want to thank and, and let you get the chance to know your board of directors. Uh, so again, I'll ask them to stand and we'll hold our applause to the end. Um, our vice president is Amanda Leahy. Our secretary is Allison Moss. Treasurer is Byron Rushing. Uh, directors at large who are here, Jeremy Charzan, Jesse Holzer, and Connor Semler. 
And then um, they could not be here today, but Kate Whitfield, Marianne Coos, and Jing Zhang are also board members, and um, we're grateful to all of them for their service. Thank you. And now you also know what we all look like, so we're really interested in hearing how is this experience going for you? What are you liking about the conference? What are you hoping we might change or explore by the time the next one comes around? Um, so feel free to come and talk to us. I've already had some great conversations this morning. Uh, I also wanna ask anyone to stand who has served on the APVP board at any time in our 25 year history. Excellent, thank you. We really value that through line. You know, it's a, it's a good community that can keep people from, you know, from the beginning as well as bringing in new people. Uh, now you get to hear a little bit of an overview of what we've been working on um, at, as an organization. Uh, we can't cover everything, which is great that we're, we're, we're working on a lot of stuff. So this is just an overview of what we thought was most um, important, our biggest accomplishments. But if you want to learn more about what we're up to and what we've been doing for you and in your name, um, come talk to any of us. So we uh, did a strategic planning process a couple of years back, as one does, and came out of that with three main goals as an organization, and that was to embody operational excellence, sustainability, accountability, and transparency. Secondly, to engage, connect, and educate our members so that you can grow and succeed professionally. And thirdly, to provide influential and authoritative leadership to advance active and healthy communities. So uh, some of the things we've worked on in pursuit of those goals this year, um, how many of you uh, used to be on the old APBP list serve? Okay, and how many of you have successfully started using the new community? That's wonderful. So the new community, is what we're calling it, um, offers a bunch of benefits compared to our old, old listserv. Uh, you know, super modern things like um, message threading, uh, but also, you know, there's a web interface and there are ways for you to set your preferences. There are ways for us to create sub-communities for more in-depth conversations um, and for us to, you know, help our, our chapters thrive. Um, so if you have not started using the new community at all, please, uh, Melanie, will you raise your hand? Melanie Bowser is our executive director. Uh, she would love to talk with you here or afterwards about how you can get connected and how you can set up the preferences so it works for you. Uh, if you feel like it's too much email and you're not sure how to set up the digest or whatever it is, let her know. We really want to make it that um, a tool for you because that's what replaces this when we can't all be together. Um, that, that's our community um, at, at the rest of our time. So we hope you're enjoying that experience. I, I feel like I've seen a huge uptick in participation engagement and I've really valued that there are, there are more voices coming into conversations um, than I think we saw in the past. So thank, thank you for those of you who made the transition. I know change is hard. We're also very happy and privileged to continue to have Karen Whitaker working with us as our policy specialist. Uh, where's, is Karen in the room? Karen, yes. Uh, so raise your hand again in the back. Uh, Karen um, contracts with us to advise us on policy, and she works closely with our policy committee. Uh, so she helps us find opportunities when, let's say, an APBP policy statement is really timely, um, works with our policy committee to uh, identify the things that we want to start making statements about. Um, uh, so some of the things we've done, Karen, you can sit down, but thank you. Uh, so some of the things we've done lately are uh, we signed on to the Complete Streets Act of 2019 as an organization. Um, we've su supported follow-up on the active transportation report in Canada through a letter to the Canadian Council of Ministers responsible for transportation and highway safety. Um, by the way, uh, we serve Canada as well as um, as the United States, and it's really important to us in the policy committee that we're not always just talking about U.S. federal policy, so I want to make that commitment to you publicly. Uh, we provided a practitioner's perspective on federal policy issues for the next transportation bill, and we published three different policy statements on electric bikes, complete streets, and automated driving systems. So I hope you've had the chance to see those policy statements. I hope they're useful to you. If you're going to your electeds or decision makers and saying, it's not just my personal opinion, look, this national organization organization thinks this is a good idea. Uh, please use those. And we intend to keep those updated as, as things change and emerge. So also feel free to flag for us if you see any aspect of our published policies that might merit a revisit. 
Um, we also, uh, one of our signature programs, of course, is the monthly webinar series. So our webinarios team, one of our most active and dedicated uh, committees, uh, work tirelessly to bring you great content every month. Some of the ones recently have been bus stops with bikeways, accessibility on shared streets, and finding common ground with first responders. Uh, we just sent out, I think it was two Fridays ago, a call for proposals for next year's webinar series, and we're trying something a little different. Our committee has identified areas that they think are timely and on which they are looking for proposals, but there's also some room for you to let us know. Maybe there's an issue we didn't see or you know, someone whose voice or, or project that you really think our practitioners need to hear about. So there's a, a way for you to uh, let us know through the, the proposal process. Right, Tony? Did I get that right? Yes, okay. We're also very proud to have started a new scholarship program this year with the Diversity and Inclusion Scholarship, um, and that, that allowed people to come to this conference. Uh, so we had nine people able to come to this conference through that, and uh, the, uh, our donors made that possible. So People for Bikes, Strava, Oregon ITE, Ride Report, and SPIN all contributed to that, and, and um, we're really grateful to them. Uh, our chapters program is also a way for us to acknowledge that some things just happen best or are more fun in person IRL. Um, so we have 20 local chapters at present and we're always uh, interested, if you think that you want to form a chapter or that, that there's sort of like potential for that in your region, we're happy to talk with you. And uh, we had a chapter gathering yesterday, right, yesterday, that I heard re went really well, looking forward to a report, um, and where people shared ideas about the many different creative things that our chapters have been doing this year. So just, you know, some of those highlights was a bicycling summit in Arizona, active transportation summits in British Columbia as well as Missouri, a scavenger hunt in Chicago in Grant Park, and lots of brown bag lunches and happy hours as well as walking and biking events. Uh, we recently welcomed our newest chapter, the Wisconsin chapter, so that's, oh, that's 24 local. Um, so thanks to all of you who serve as chapter leaders and volunteers. And um, we have um, our board of directors, but of course our committees have uh, many, many volunteers, and that's where a lot of the work happens. So if, if you feel moved by any of what you've heard, or if you want to learn more about some of our other work around uh, mentoring, around membership, we would love to talk with you about volunteering on a committee. Um, so you can talk with any of our board members, talk with Melanie, and then there are fishbowls by registration as well. If you want to express interest by dropping a business card in one of those uh, for a certain committee, um, let us know. Uh, and now, really importantly, we want to be very transparent with you about what we're doing with your membership dues, and so our treasurer, Byron, will present a report. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for letting me serve on the board uh, for several years now, and in particular, um, in several roles, but probably the most importantly, as treasurer. Uh, this is, of course, the most important uh, couple of minutes of the members meeting as well as the conference I would like to think uh, because we as board of directors take it very seriously that our duty is first and foremost to maintain the um, financial and fiduciary responsibility of the association to keep it sustainable over time um, and we are so happy to be here in our 25th year um, coming into a really coming out of a really strong year and into another really strong year um, I am not going to go into all the details of our budget. If you would like to see that, it's always available to members. Um, please reach out to myself or to Melanie Bowser, and we are happy to share that as well as any other financial documents um, with dues paid members, but we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so uh, broadly, APBP's board and our financial committee operate under a very conservative budgeting strategy, um, and we stay apprised of both revenues and expenses of the organization on a monthly basis. I would like to give a particular thanks to AMR staff um, led by Melanie with some of their other um, office staff in uh, Lexington for helping us reimagine how we look at our data. Um, typically, I, I am not a great numbers guy, so they have made them more picture oriented for me. Um, but we have graphs with both month over month and year over year, uh, revenue expenditures and membership. Um, so the board is getting a very clear picture on all of our monthly board meetings um, where we are compared to last month, this time last year, um, and trends over time. So it's much easier for us to make decisions um, with those kind of basic um, things. And we have a lot of trends moving up right now, which is great. Um, this, along with uh, keeping an eye on overall financial trends um, 
from year to year allow us to be nimble and ensure we are meeting our uh, responsibility to the association and you, the members. Um, as a reminder, our primary revenue streams are membership dues, first and foremost, uh, webinar fees. Uh, a lot of people ask us why members still have to pay for webinars, um, and we have not gone to free webinars for members because it is a big revenue driver for us. Uh, we are hoping to continue to look at that question in the future, um, but for right now, we have to maintain um, a webinar discount for members. Um, so thank you for being a membership, being a member or being a chapter member, um, and hopefully um, that is helping attend webinars because that's an important revenue stream for us. Um, the biennial conference um, and our sponsorship. So again, uh, please thank our sponsors. Go by their table and talk to them um, if you get a chance today. I will say briefly about the biennial conference. Um, we, we operate with a big year in odd years, uh, of, the, of which this is one, um, with a leaner year followed in even years. So big attendance at conferences, big sponsorships at conferences, uh, actually carries us through two years. Um, so it's one reason why we are really excited to have such great attendance um, to break all the records that I, I know of for attendance um, at the APVP conference um, and really have strong presence here because that covers us not only for um, breaking even and exceeding our expectations for the conference event itself, but it uh, clears us for 2019 and carries us through 2020. So it's very important, um, and we are so excited to have everybody here. Um, and thank you to the local host committee and everybody who's put in the work to make this such a great event. Um, finally, um, as I will remind you every time I up here on stage, we are a membership-based organization, so the dues that you pay are critical. Uh, we have been very thankful to the AMR staff for revamping our membership reminders. So if you start getting nagged leading up to that membership renewal, um, that is because membership is our biggest revenue stream, and it is very important for us to keep um, people uh, paid up on time and continuing over time. We recognize that people don't become members and they don't stay APBP members if they're not getting the value for that. Um, so we're always constantly looking at both uh, the membership dues, the rates. We have several different tiers um, that we bring people in at, as well as the um, services that we offer through the community, through the webinars, the other things that we offer that hopefully make APBP membership as valuable as any other professional membership that you have, if not more so. Um, uh, benefits such as the community, uh, discounted webinars, local chapters. Uh, we very much appreciate your continued participation in the APBP, and please know that your money is going towards a better organization uh, and the benefits that we provide you. If you ever have concerns about that, please reach out to any board member, uh, myself, Melanie, or anybody else um, in the association, and we'll be happy to either try to answer your questions or take your feedback um, so that we can continue to have another strong 25 years um, with good revenue. Thank you very much. Let me be over here. And next we get to do our annual awards, which is always super exciting. So Amanda, our vice president and the chair of the awards jury will handle that. Hello, everyone. So first, I want to extend a big thank you to anyone who submitted a nomination this year. You really made the job of the awards jury tough and it's clear that there are a lot of talented and um, passionate individuals out there. We can't recognize them all today, but I am very excited to say that all six award winners have joined us here in Portland. So as I announce your award, we ask that you come forward for a photo and then stay up just in front of the stage here for a group photo after all of the winners have been announced. First up, the Young Professional of the Year Award goes to Danielle Hess. Danielle is a project assistant at the Western Transportation Institute, and she receives this award in appreciation for her enthusiasm and commitment to improving our streets by com combining her passions of health and transportation. Danielle's approach to researching, planning, and implementing pop-up projects has led to many permanent traffic calming projects. Her work and insights are helping the city of Bozeman, Montana create more meaningful public engagement, empower residents to participate in finding solutions to neighborhood speeding, and introduce opportunities to make lasting safety improvements on short time frames and with limited budgets. So congratulations. <laughs> Our private sector professional of the year is Brian Patterson. Brian is principal senior transportation planner at Urban Systems. 
This award is in appreciation for his vast contribution to building a professional network through membership and education in Canada. Brian's efforts to quantify bicycling data, educate engineers, and develop a network of enthusiastic professionals throughout Canada will have a long-lasting impact on the country and beyond. The Public Sector Professional of the Year Award goes to Paul Martin. As an active transportation coordinator for the Orange County Transportation Authority, Paul receives this award for his contributions to projects and programs that make a significant difference in safety, accessibility, and quality of life in Orange County. Paul's success in planning, funding, and building projects in Orange County assures active transportation stays at the forefront of Orange County's future transportation needs. Thank you. This year's Nonprofit Professional of the Year Award is presented to Katherine Gerves, Executive Director of Yay Bikes. Her plaque reads, in appreciation for her unparalleled enthusiasm and commitment to improving the way people design and bicycle on roads in the state of Ohio. Catherine's people-first approach has led to a program where engineers, people who bike, and health professionals work together to discuss effective treatments for bicyclists of all skill levels. She has also developed one-on-one -on -one bicycle training for those who are bike curious. Catherine's expertise has spread throughout the state with our Train the Trainer programs. This is only the second year for our Research Professional of the Year Award, and it's being given to Dr. Robert Schneider. Robert is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, he is being recognized for his contributions advancing the state of practice in bicycle and pedestrian safety research. Dr. Schneider has worked to further our field and the professional knowledge of others through research to improve knowledge of yielding behavior, the impact of roadway features on pedestrian crashes, and using land use and transportation variables to estimate facility demand. And now for the very high honor of APBP's 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award, which recognizes an individual who has made a substantial commitment to the profession during their lifetime and who has shown excellence in the field of bicycle and pedestrian planning, design, advocacy, and or education. I welcome Sally Flox to the stage to receive this award. So some of you are familiar with her and her work. Uh, Sally is president and CEO of PEDS, a small advocacy group that makes big things happen. Her plaque reads, in appreciation for her unparalleled commitment to improving safety and accessibility for all pedestrians in the Atlanta metro area. Sally's approach of following research and real world implementation, along with her ability to make things happen, helped assure people of all ages and abilities would have safe opportunities to walk in the Atlanta metro area. She is truly working today for a more walkable tomorrow. Congratulations to Sally and all of this year's APB award winners. I believe you have some words to share. Okay, thank you. Receiving your award is a tremendous honor, and I'm very grateful. It's also a wonderful way to cap my career leading PEDS. I want to share with you, uh, well, I was actually going to start by saying more about PEDS, but you've already said a lot about PEDS. We are a small organization. We've actually expanded our mission to include all of Georgia, really focusing on creating safe streets, accessible streets, making them inviting to all pedestrians. I do want to share a few of the achievements that I'm most proud of. These include making safe routes to transit a, financial, a funding priority 
at both the state and regional level, helping people with disabilities document the barriers they face and helping them gain legal representation. And then, now I'm going blank. <laughs> um, Train, providing training workshops that have enabled hundreds of transportation professionals in Georgia learn how to design streets for pedestrian safety. None of this would, would have been possible without the support from others. And I especially want to recognize three people. First, I want to recognize Ellen Vanderslice. <laughs> And she was my first and most important mentor. Second, Dan Burden, right there, <laughs> for expanding my vision and helping me recognize that to make real change, we need to use our brains, feel our hearts, and have the courage to get beyond guidelines. And finally, Michael Ronkin, who taught me so much about and taught me so quickly about the real key to pedestrian safety being good street design. But we still have a long way to go. The achievements I mentioned have been really gratifying, and I have just one more to mention because this is one that was the number one reason that I even founded PEDS, and that has been getting Atlanta drivers to increase their compliance with crosswalk laws. So we have come a long way, but we have even a farther way to go. Last year, over 6,000 people in America lost their lives while walking. This is unacceptable. And for too long, advocates have been asked to quell their anger and to instead, or any sense of anger, and to instead come in with cooperation and peace. But in seeing these improvements implemented to our streets has been painfully slow. And what we need most is a greater sense of urgency. And I want to end by calling on all of you to make that sense of urgency a reality. And I call on you also to make the changes, to implement them, move it forward, so that we have a safe culture and also safe streets. And with that, we will truly make America a great place to walk. Uh, the next thing to talk about is when we're all going to get together again. So um, we hold the APBP conference every, every other year, off cycle with Walk Bike Places, but I'm sure the vast majority of us will be at Walk Bike Places, and APBP has always played a role in, in leading that, that, uh, uh, that conference. Um, so we'll see you in Indianapolis next August, but the next APBP conference is going to be in 2021, and we are going to visit Big Reveal Tony personally. We're all camping out in his yard. Uh, no, we're going to Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota um, in August of uh, 2021, and we're so excited. I, I happened to be in town for work a couple months ago. I went and checked out the venue we selected. It's terrific. It's, you know, surrounded by the country's best bike path network. Um, I think you're going to have a great time. So again, thanks for being here in Portland, uh, helping us celebrate the achievements of all our wonderful award winners, learn from each other, have fun, uh, refill our tanks to go back to our day jobs and our burgeoning inboxes. So with that, we're concluding the business portion of our meeting. <laughs> Shifting gears, as it were. Um, into our keynote presentation. So I, I get to introduce our, our keynote presenter, uh, who is Lynn Peterson, our Metro Council President. Uh, we have, I believe, the only elected uh, regional government in the country. So Lynn is our, our elected president of that. Uh, I've known her for 20 years, and she, every role she's ever played, she's been um, uh, the smartest and most capable person in that room. So she's uh, known as a national problem solver and expert in land use and transportation. Uh, she always looks to uh, build safe, healthy, and equitable communities through innovation. And um, some, of the, some of her past 
accomplishments that I think are really relevant for what we're dealing with. She was the CEO of the Washington State Department of Transportation. Was that your title, CEO? Secretary, yeah, the Secretary of the Washington State Department of Transportation. And prior to that, she served in Oregon as Governor Kitts Haber's Senior Transportation and Sustainability Policy Advisor. So looking at transportation and energy policy, statewide transportation funding, and implementation of community priorities. Uh, before that, she cut her teeth on local politics at the Clackamas County Commission and on the Lake Oswego City Council. Um, you're also a uh, engineer, right? Yep, she can do it all. Uh, and then moderating the Q&A afterwards uh, is Dr. Marisa Zapata. She's an educator, scholar, and planner here at Portland State University, and she's committed to achieving spatially-based social justice by preparing planners to act in the face of uncertain and inequitable futures. She believes how we use land reflects our social and cultural values, and her research uh, looks at three questions. One, how can future-oriented actors plan across deeply embedded cultural differences to produce just and sustainable places? Two, how how can planners prepare places to act in the face of uncertainty and the multiple futures that may unfold in that place? And three, what are the most effective institutional arrangements between governments and civic society to collaborate reason regionally? Uh, she's especially concerned about equitable planning for uncertain futures in diverse communities, and I think you'll see why we asked her to moderate when you hear Lynn's remarks. Please walk join me in welcoming Lynn. Good morning, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Yeah. How was Portland? Is it treating you well? Were you warm enough? Yeah, yeah. We were way too warm. Um, I just want to take a moment and tell you a little bit about Metro because it is the only elected regional government in the country, and the question is, what does that mean? Uh, we were created out of the angst of uh, the past over why did we have a council of governments, and a lot of you know more about MPOs in that setting and council of governments, so we, are not, we do not run the transit agency. I just wanted to dispel that right away. Uh, most, most transit agencies are called Metro. We do not run the transit agency, that is TriMet, and they are awesome partners in everything that we do. Um, but what we do is basically everybody, everybody's uh, livability um, uh, dream. We uh, manage the waste for the entire region. Once it's collected, we have to figure out where it's gonna go, how it's gonna get disposed of, and how it's gonna get recycled. And so we are working really hard in that field to make sure that uh, for the future we are recycling at higher rates because as you know, all of us are kind of been stagnated and uh, we have uh, issues around recycling and also making sure that the big, uh, the, the big push forward is that local businesses can actually make local jobs on the recycling front. So I think uh, everything that you hear me talk about today is about creating uh, that, those opportunities for those who have not been able to get into these fields and uh, racial equality, climate change, and uh, economic justice. Uh, so we do waste management. We have a regional uh, park system, 17,000 acres across the region, uh, and we have very much based this on our partners uh, at the MPO level at Minneapolis. So thank you for being our North Star on a regional park system. And uh, then we manage all of the venues, including the Oregon Zoo. So if you haven't gotten enough to see the bears in the bathtubs trying to keep cool at the Oregon Zoo, I would encourage you to do so. It is the deepest uh, station in North America uh, on the light rail station. So if you wanna go get cool, just go to that station and sit. It's got lovely art, <laughs> um, but, but it is one of, one of the best parts of Portland if you have that opportunity, and then walk down to the Rose Garden and the Japanese Garden. Uh, the last thing that we do uh, is why we're all here, and that is land use and transportation planning. So we do have the MPO functions, but according to Oregon Land Use Planning Program and the authority granted to us when the voters decided to create Metro, we actually have the authority to carry out the 20-year plan. It is not just an a, 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 a compilation of uh, everybody's wish lists and everybody's uh, different desires of how they will grow. We actually have a regional conversation and make some pretty big trade-offs. Uh, and those are pretty hard, tense discussions. And we've never had to use the authority granted to us because we work together. And that sounds like you know, uh, something that nobody could ever accomplish. And it, I'm not saying it's easy. It's really hard. 
but we do work to actually have a conversation of where we will grow and how we will grow, and that uh, is the 2040 vision that every all 24 cities and three counties point towards, and all investment strategies within this region must follow that. So when we when we lay out the vision, we're also laying out the requirements of um, not how to get there. Everybody has their own way of getting there, but we are laying out the outcomes that we all intend to get to, and if you don't achieve those outcomes within your projects and programs, then you don't get regional state funding. So it's just as easy as that. You're not gonna be carrying out uh, programs that put you in competition with your adjacent cities or try to expand your, urban, your portion of the urban growth boundary without a full discussion. So it's very exciting to be part of Metro. I've been here uh, for six months, and uh, it's very, amazing to be part and parcel again of forwarding the agenda here in the region on bike and ped because a lot of you know uh, this isn't just about trying to get to vision zero it's not just about uh, trying to get to um, uh, a more complete system but this is an industry and this industry uh, needs to be uh, Buoyed by actually having infrastructure that's out there to provide uh, safety so everybody has that choice and has that ability. Um, I don't know if you've already heard this number, but the biking industry in Portland uh, contributes more than 300 million to the economy here. So it's a big deal. So while there's more work to be done in, in the region, we're very proud of the progress we've made and the opportunities it represents. I was drawn to the city for so many different reasons 23 years ago from Wisconsin, where my Badgers. Woohoo! <laughs> a little bit more woohoo. Good grief! Not you're not showing the cause here. Um, yeah, uh, I moved here from Madison, Wisconsin, where I got a degree in civil and environmental engineering. I grew up in Madison, born in Milwaukee, um, and came out here to understand planning because my journey has been uh, an understanding of how to actually use my engineering knowledge to build community, not to just build roads, and that's a big deal. That was a very long and hard journey, and it took me from uh, engineering into uh, travel forecasting uh, with a planning degree, which blew my mind here at Portland State University, uh, because there was a whole lot of things that I was then um, made more aware of. The context, the politics, everything that you don't learn in engineering school. I learned how to make sure that nothing failed. Right, I know material science. I know when the concrete is gonna fail. I know when the rebar is gonna fail. I know when the bridge is gonna fail, most of them, except for the one that went down when the truck hit it. <laughs> um, can't predict those things. Uh, but the, the point being, that's what I learned. I, I did not learn how to uh, actually make a complete street. Uh, I learned uh, how to make sure that the truck could maintain its speed through the intersection. So uh, then going into Wisconsin DOT and being faced with a project that I didn't agree with, and the question to me was, well, we need you. You're, the, you're our traffic engineer for the district. Will you actually work on this project? And I said, no. So what am I going to do now? <laughs> um, so I went into planning school and uh, quickly learned that the planning portion wasn't even where I could make the most decisions or get the most policy uh, oomph out of what we needed to do. I actually had to get elected. So I started out as a city councilor and then county commissioner and now uh, at the region. And this is where you can actually do a lot of help, um, both advocates as well as the public and private sector, is being able to inform and encourage young folk to actually go get elected. And women, please run. We need everybody in this audience to understand that it is not, it's not just being the public professional um, doing the work. We need folks in elected positions that will carry this message forward and will ask the hard questions when the engineer comes into the room. And I know there are a lot of engineers in this room, um, and I'm not dissing on them because I am one. Um, but it, it really is, there's a, lot, there's a lot of education left to do, and uh, you all are are primed to do that work. So please uh, think about that. Don't just, don't just think that that's something that you would never be able to attain. It, it is something that you should think about and seriously consider uh, moving forward. So I was drawn to the city for a lot of reasons, but a lot of it is because there are risk takers here. 
And that is what we need in order to be able to move these agendas forward, especially something like Vision Zero. Uh, it's hardwired as a Portland value at this point. We don't rest on our laurels. We uh, may have done that for a little while here, but we quickly realized we were doing it and started uh, picking ourselves back up and moving forward. We try to be the best that we possibly can. And I've seen this uh, from every level of government from the from the bottom as an entry level transportation modeler at Metro 20 years ago to the top as Washington Department of Transportation and now as elected Metro Council President. Metro is exceptional at this and the people in the room who have made our active transportation success a reality deserve a round of applause and I'm going to ask them to stand. Everybody from Portland who has worked in the Portland region who has worked on this um, for the la for however long please stand and just be recognized. This has been a long process. I started uh, part of my career at uh, City of Portland in traffic, in traffic calming um, when it was a thing. Uh, there was also a bicycling uh, program and that was a thing. And we had to re-engineer all of our thinking uh, in the region as well as the, as the city. And suddenly, 20 years later, we don't have those programs because everybody knows that this is the way you do business. And I think that's, that's a huge testament to the success of, of how, how we moved forward. We incorporated all of the advocates actually into the public sector and the private sector and started producing better projects. Uh, so thank you to all of those who led the way on that. We are facing now three major, major challenges in transportation and it's climate, racial equity, and economic justice. Last week, a Boeing 747 Super tanker left Sacramento and flew 10 hours southeast to Santa Cruz, Bolivia. From there, it joined efforts to suppress out of control fires burning in the Amazon. In the midst of the hottest summer in recorded history, the lungs of the planet are burning. And we as humanity were so desperate, so desperate that we burned 10 tons of fuel in an effort to get a jet there to fight the fires. We need to hurry ourselves out of this carbon based transportation system and we need to do it now. It's gonna take a comprehensive approach. And all of you know transportation policy making is not an island, it's tied to housing. It's tied to environmental quality and it's tied to economic development and it's tied to our current political climate. We have to try something new and that's why I've asked Metro to look at Portland's transportation system from a corridor perspective. In November 2020, we will be voting on in the first ever transportation package for this region. I did not want that package to reflect 30-year-old projects from a list of projects in our regional transportation plan. We need to move this forward, so we're rethinking all of the corridors within our region. What are the priority corridors and what are the programmatic investments for all modes to move more people and move freight more efficiently? That's a complete and utter change for the nation, but a lot of you have actually influenced my thinking on this because you each have an element that you've been working on. I want you to understand the importance of the corridor, not in projects. Projects do not make a system, right? You all know this because of the lack of connectivity in the bike and ped network. We have been focusing on one light rail corridor at a time over the last three decades, which means that we've improved about five or six corridors in this region over the time that I've been working in this region. But that's only five or six corridors, and they weren't in the places that needed accessibility. They weren't in the places that needed health benefits. They weren't in the places that would actually provide more affordable housing. So we have put all our time and effort into those corridors to create a light rail system that is the best in the nation and we love it, but we ignored the rest of the region to our detriment. So now we are working on creating these mobility corridors to help connect the region and take it out for a vote. And that vote will be around whether it actually increases accessibility, basically promotes racial equity across our region and provides economic justice. So if we look at these corridors, and a lot of you have the mobility uh, to 
the mobile tours. Uh, we are looking at things like 82nd Avenue, which is out to the east side in East Portland, or Tualatin Valley Highway, which runs basically from Beaverton all the way out to Forest Grove at the edge of our urban growth boundary. But these are not straight lines just on a map, right? You can just look at them as, oh, we're, we're improving the roads. No, we are looking at the completeness of the system for all the modes. So how we look at how we connect people to those mobility corridors. Where are they going and what challenges do they have in their daily lives to get to those corridors? And we can promise with a straight face, we will make transportation better for everyone on 82nd and TV Highway because we will have looked at all of the modes and the safety for all of those modes. And it won't just be about one intersection and a left turn lane. I'm done with that. We need to actually put the projects down on the mat and make it a programmatic investment in every single one of these modes. So we can deliver safer streets for bicyclists and pedestrians connecting to faster transit by giving higher priority to transit and serving people in more and better housing, which is the key component of what this region does well, is that we marry transportation and land use in a way that no one else has. And this package, with any luck, will marry affordable housing with every investment we make in transportation in those corridors. And I have to give credit where credit is due. Some of you know or have heard of the concept of the Albina Vision, the Rose Corridor across the way where our uh, Coliseum, uh, the convention center that uh, Metro manages, and uh, the Blazer Stadium all sit, uh, used to be the black community. It used to be a neighborhood, and it used to be called Lower Albina. That is no longer the case. So Rakaya Adams, who has been working very hard for Meyer Memorial Trust, has set out a new template for us. She saw that the highway planners, the land use planners, had historically just looked at the lines on a map, the streets, just lines on a map, and not what was around them, except to think about how they could separate and demolish and segregate. So when ODOT started talking about fixing the decades-old bottleneck on I-5, in the heart of our city, at the Rose Quarter, she challenged them to do better and to do more. To think about Interstate 5's place in the city and the community. To think about Interstate 5's role in the destruction of the Albina community. And to ODOT's credit, they have listened. Did they succeed in achieving a vision that works for everyone yet? No. There's a lot more work to be done, but right now, nobody's happy. Nobody's happy with how things have proceeded, but doing nothing is not an option. In order to move forward a vision that provides for economic justice and provides for the black community to come back into that area, which was and should be their neighborhood, the Albina vision needs to be successful, and it needs to be fully integrated into the surrounding communities. Not an island of development surrounded by a river on one side and an interstate and a trench in the other. And that means pausing and listening to the community. And I think some of you probably uh, who have been attending and watching the news here over the last two days, uh, ODOT has said that they will not proceed with their environmental assessment, which was the shortcut uh, to getting a project and doing project delivery on time uh, under budget, but they are willing now to go back and do an environmental impact statement, which uh, they should be given a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> It's the, it's the right thing to do, and uh, it will uh, actually document uh, the cumulative impacts as well as the impacts uh, that all of these things are having today and start looking at what do we actually need to do to move a, a better vision forward for uh, improvements on I-5 and to the community itself. Because each and every one of us knows that when you have a, a big vision, who, who's in charge of it? It's really hard to get everybody to, to move in the same and row in the same direction, right? So that's where we're at right now. So that template that we've been working on with Albino Vision is one that we will be using at Metro as we look to the 2020 ballot. All through the summer, community members have been uh, taking us around the potential transportation corridors to tell us what we need to know about each and every one of these corridors, how they use those corridors, what they need in those corridors. This isn't just an engineering LOS uh, exercise, right? This is what, what do we need to do to make this work for people and for the businesses. We have been a little too arrogant in the past 
and we're trying to break that cycle. We don't know everything. Even us as professionals in this room who are planners, engineers, activists, we don't know. We actually don't know and we need to approach everything as we don't know so that we we're sitting there and listening and picking up on really key nuggets that the, the community has to tell us if we allow them. Not long ago, I had someone, a young person that was actually um, working for me, tell me that Interstate Max was a failure for the community. I had worked really hard on that project as an activist. I had worked on it from the public side. I had worked on it from the private side. It really hit me hard. As a transportation engineer, as a numeric modeler, as an elected official, everything about the Interstate Max line felt like a success. 13,000 people a day boarding the yellow line in Portland. We've seen hundreds of new apartment units, including affordable, go up around the line. We've seen new businesses launch and old businesses find new wealth. But I had to stop and hear what he was trying to tell me. He was saying that the community was not brought along in the process and was shut out of the wealth that was generated. Look, we all know that our parts of the region, there are parts of the region that need some economic improvement. Some of those areas are in these transportation corridors, but how do we do that work in a way that brings justice and shared prosperity to the people who are most likely to be affected by the change? We have to change the way we do things. 15 years ago, people used to talk about the Pearl District over here as a model for development. And the Pearl District is a very nice place. And I know many people who enjoy living or shopping or dining there. I've heard it referred to as the bourgeois bohemian district. But we know that if the whole center city and every transit corridor became the Pearl District, we have failed. We need to change our path for discussion. We need to include more voices and we need to be broader in our perspectives. And we need to think both outwards as well as inwards. How do we share the city's prosperity with those middle ring communities like the Cully neighborhood in Portland or Oak Grove in Clackamas County and Aloha in Washington County and the Lentz community. So that children there can have the resources they need at school. So that parents can walk across the street safely. So that everyone has access to a job or health care, and it isn't a burdensome commute away. How do we work on comprehensive approaches to displacement prevention? So that individual businesses aren't burdened with endless analysis but can streamline into communities benefit agreements and other tools for community stability. And how do we do all of this with the resources we have? Or how do we convince the voters at the regional level since that, that is where we can get the best return on our investments and to provide more resources for those communities? And how do we get through all of that talking in a way that is inclusive and respective respectful and informative and make sure we still have the energy and motivation to get stuff done once we know what the right stuff to get done is. This is our burden. These are our challenges. No place in America did a better job pushing back against the mid-century core rot that plagued other parts of this country. We made mistakes and we left people behind and we are learning from that now and trying to correct it. We are learning from you. You all have big ideas and have been struggling with these ideas far longer than we have. And so we're looking to you. This place can be a template for tomorrow, for the next challenge, for equitable development, for climate action and economic justice, for saving the middle rings that every city has, and for making sure that safety, health, and prosperity are available to all. So thank you for everything you do and keep doing it and run for office. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Marisa Zapata, and I am not seeing any questions so far, which seems impossible to me. And I know that uh, Metro Councilor Peterson would prefer if I not ask all of the questions. <laughs> um, I do want to thank uh, President Peterson for a great speech. I got to hear her for the first time several years ago at a Portland State University graduate school graduation. Do we have any Merps in the audience? Merps. Woo! Woo! Much better than the Badger. Or was it Beavers? Badger. Badger, sorry. 
That's true. Um, <laughs> so I, um, she won the Urban Pioneer Award, which is an annual award given out for the College of Urban and Public Affairs. And I was so excited because it was a woman, a planner, an engineer, and let's be honest, a lot of times the engineering planner people aren't the most excited about politics, right? Oh, no jokes, <laughs> no jokes. Um, and so it was amazing to see somebody owning that, bringing the deep technical knowledge into the field and then actually embracing the politics. And so I'm just really thrilled to be sitting next to you five years later, six years later. Um, all right, so we'll start off. We've got a great question on racial equity. All right, so how do you apply a racial equity framework to the current work that you are doing? I think you got to this in the speech, but maybe some more flushing out of what that actually looks like. You know, I think uh, it's from several different standpoints, uh, and I have to credit Metro for all the work done prior to me coming out in January. Uh, we. Uh, have really been moving in a direction of uh, making sure that as we start out our conversations, uh, we're doing a round robin of everybody, just to get an idea of, and, and I mean everybody, um, every, 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 uh, every organization that works in kind of the economic justice, racial equity, as well as in the advocacy world of the normal things that we you know, uh, are used to, um, because, but then we start to move away from just the, the listening mode to the participation uh, conversation, um, whether it's our task forces or special groups that we set up just to work on uh, what does the lens look like. Uh, we pay a lot of folks to be participants in uh, our work. Uh, so that they can bring their expertise to the table because we are paying them for their expertise. Not, it, it's not just a pay to, pay to play, it's a you, you are an expert in your field, we wanna recognize you as such and make sure that, uh, that, that you are compensated for your time because a lot of these organizations are new startups basically in the last five years and they don't have the resources and the grants aren't there to just go participate in some of these things. They're, you know, they're about uh, accomplishing a set of goals that you actually applied for the grant for. So we, we've been doing a lot of work on, on basically being able to get the right table set with, the, with a more diverse set of people and then being able to uh, pay a lot of folks to come in and actually be experts to even, even feed information up into these groups. Um, that are making recommendations. The other thing that uh, I would say we're doing is um, being very open to uh, people not answering our question. <laughs> um, for instance, we have a parks bond measure out right now. In the development of that parks bond measure, we uh, had a lot of conversations with the uh, with uh, tribes and and Native American. Um, folks that may not be a part of a tribe, but uh, they didn't want to talk about where should we buy land. They didn't want to have that conversation. They wanted to talk about how we were going to manage the land. Um, but, and that plays a role then in how we, how we talk about this bond measure. The, the other point I would just make is that the council then when creating the bond measure had um, both a climate change and a racial equity overlay that we were putting on um, how we constructed it, and it was about getting access, what kind of access we heard people needed, and a lot of it was just safety. It wasn't that they needed um, a whole lot other than to know that they would be welcome in the space. So are the languages there? Uh, are there pictures of people who look like them? Um, are the staff sticking up for, you know, for folks, when there's a when they're the, the rangers, are they are they there to help mitigate um, issues that come up? So a lot of good things came out of these discussions. They had nothing to do with the parks bond measure itself and the capital projects, but a lot of it is capital projects. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's a multiple um, a multiple layer onion that uh, of of work that has gone into that. But there were things that we learned that we need to do better for the transportation bond measure for November of 2020. So I think following up on that, we've got a bunch of questions about racial equity. 
Um, I think that the part of the, the challenge that people see in Portland is that there's a lot of great discussions, mm -hmm. but then what does that actually look like when it's operationalized? Right. So in the bond in the parks bond measure itself, which I forgot to mention, um, we have expectations of uh, what the jurisdictions will be doing because a lot of the money is goes to Metro itself, and a lot of the money goes to the jurisdictions, and so we're trying to bring everybody up to speed. Um, so whether it be uh, uh, voluntary goals on minority contracting or where the park's uh, investment is being made and who and how is included in the decision of what parks should be invested in. So uh, we're doing this with our affordable housing bond measure that we just passed this last November, 652.8 million for 3,900 units, 12,000 hopefully people will be um, housed in the next uh, five years. Um, we, we have intergovernmental agreements with every single jurisdiction because we actually don't do housing. We're just the vehicle by which we raise the money or putting out on the street, but the region has expectations of how that money will be used. And so everybody is coming to terms with higher goals on climate change, on racial equity, um, on all of these things we're trying to raise the bar up and, and make it consistent across the region. So. Uh, right now, we're working on a 20% uh, voluntary goal for minority contracting, um, where some of them had had zero. All right, thank you. Uh, I think going along that line, um, we talked a little bit about the politics of working with Metro, and specifically, someone raised the question of since House Bill 2001 does not require the Portland region to integrate transportation planning when allowing for missing middle housing, how does Metro plan to work with communities to integrate transportation in their housing plans? I think this is a question that applies to everything. How do you do it? How do you get the jurisdictions to behave? <laughs> You know, it, um, this has been a 25-year struggle uh, where we first started out with the majority of the cities in this region not wanting Metro to tell them what to do to, hey, will you make us go do this? So uh, I think that's where we sit now is uh, we, we need, you know, the, the, the cities really want to move forward on uh, higher density uh, transit-oriented development, and it wasn't necessarily in our market prior to the last five to 10 years uh, to see higher density development out in the suburbs. And now the demand is there. And that's why we have a housing crisis and that's why we have a homelessness situation, an emergency, um, is we just don't have enough housing. So the market is now there and the mayors and the city councilors are hot to trot to get these things done. And the question is how, how fast can they run? Um, how can they streamline their development? How can they remove uh, barriers to affordable housing like system development charges um, for low, low income and affordable housing and just start getting out of the way of good development? Great. Um, there's a couple questions about politics and people are wondering what kind of messaging you have found is actually resonating with people, both in terms of the transit bond specifically, but in general, just on these topics. Yeah, I think that we found and what the polling nationally has shown is that uh, if we just talk about safety for all, housing for all, say, uh, you know, a livable region for all, uh, that kind of inclusive language is good um, and, and really um, helps us get across what we're trying to say, but not pit different demographics against each other. I think related to that and going back to a little bit on equity uh, was the question of how do you define success for racial equity? What does it mean to actually know that we're moving the needle on that? Yeah, I think we're trying to come up with performance metrics now on that. Uh, I wouldn't say that we're there yet. The, the idea of accessibility to me as the transportation data geek is one that, that kind of rises to the top uh, just right now, and that is uh, where, do we have, uh, where do we have pockets in this region that are so isolated by past transportation projects that they can't even walk to get to the transit? Right? or it's not safe to walk to get to the transit. Um, so accessibility to me is a key measure um, for 
how do we, how do we, when we know we have pockets in the community that are having issues, uh, both economically and it's probably driven by that isolation, that inaccessibility, how are we increasing accessibility? Health is another indicator, obviously. We have uh, major problems along the I-5 corridor with asthma. Um, and part of that, it's part and parcel to uh, the GHG emissions in the corridor. So uh, making sure that we don't, that we, we start moving in the right direction to tackle the actual problems those communities have and not just say, well, we're meeting our climate change goals for the region, so we're done, right? No, no we, we need to dig deeper and actually get into these pockets where there's, there's actual issues. A question specifically about freight. Uh, someone asked that or said that we know that freight has had a significant impact, particularly in terms of environmental justice, and people are wondering how you're engaging with freight conversations. Hmm. Um, I'm going to have to make some assumptions on that. Um, so uh, I think the big part of what this region has done over the years is not given into the level of service analysis to the degree that other regions have. Um, so we have made it very clear that our level of service analysis um, does, not, uh, does not drive our decision making. Uh, basically, it, it's about, it always has been about moving people, um, but we are very driven to um, create policies that level the playing field throughout the region. So we have a direct policy on no more than three highway through lanes in each direction on our interstates. That's a policy. Um, and we have been working to make sure that we keep to that policy uh, so that we're not just moving the congestion into other people's backyards. Um, we have come to terms through a lot of uh, fights intense conversations, whether it was in the traffic calming program with the firefighters um, on how wide the streets should be to uh, how big should the turning radius be. But it all comes down to speed, and I think that's where we're finally getting traction here in the state, um, that we need to be able to have, we need to be empowered at the local level to set our own speed standards um, and then design around that, not not around the, like I said, the, the truck turning template. Thank you. And last question, uh, can you talk a little bit about how to diversify or working on diversifying the planning field, getting more people of color, immigrants, women in positions of power, and hiring from within communities that they're, they're being engaged with? And I will say I did notice that up until this moment, uh, at least in terms of visual presentation, uh, I'm the first not white person, I believe, to be on the stage since we started this morning. Mm -hmm. So this question is particularly meaningful for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the, the uh, yeah, what's the question again? Uh, how to diversify. I went off on a different tangent, sorry. <laughs> how to di diversify the workforce. You know, um, I think there are a lot of uh, folks out there that would be interested if, if asked. You know, so just me asking everybody, to think about becoming an elected official, it is incumbent upon all of us to basically, every advocate we run across, every bright-eyed uh, child that we see, every bright-eyed MERP student, um, that uh, if you wanna shadow me, you're, you are completely welcome to come and shadow me for a day or a half day. We're, we're struggling to find enough slots, but um, uh, it, I, want, I wanna have that opportunity to show people what what the job is, and that it's not as scary as one would think. It's full of uh, decisions and hard decisions, but um, being able to show folks in real time uh, how exciting it is as well. Um, so it, it, it is more, to me, it's more about mentorship and identifying, it doesn't matter who you are, what the color of your skin is. Um, if you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and you wanna show up and do good things, um, I'm gonna be there for you. And I think every one of us in this audience knows what that's like to have been mentored, um, but also now it's time to be the mentor. Every single person in this room is now able. You've been to this conference. You've been trained. You are now a mentor. Thank you, and I will vouch for President Peterson's uh, offer for shadowing. She came to my class, offered, and I've sent several MERPs off to follow her around for half a day. 
So, all right, well, that, I think, wraps up things. Thank you so much for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you to all of you guys. Have a great morning. So I know Mike Griffith from the Federal Highway Administration, one of our platinum sponsors, wanted to come up and say a word. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. I just want to uh, give you an update from the Federal Highway Administration. First, this is my first uh, AP BP conference. I've really loved it. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. Yep. So uh, you heard during the award ceremony and you've heard uh, during other sessions that pedestrians fatalities hit a 28 year high, highest number of fatalities since 1990. Um, so I have, that's really bad tragic news, but I do have some good news. We do have a new administrator, Nicole Nason. She was sworn in on May 2nd. She has identified as one of her priorities pedestrian safety. And we are now working with her to understand what exactly her agenda is going to be for pedestrian safety. But how many people here in the room knew that, that she identified pedestrian safety as one of her priorities? You probably didn't know that because right now we haven't really rolled out anything. As you know, our agency is doing a lot of work in this area, but now we have a leader in the administrator's position who wants to do something and actually be more aggressive than when we're doing now. So I think that's good news. We want to work with the association, uh, with her leadership to advance the agenda to address the tragic news that we've all heard about. If you pull out your program on the back, I hopefully you've looked at this. This shows all of our recent Federal High Administration resources. There's a lot we're doing in pedestrian, in bicycle planning, safety, accessibility, multimodal networks, et cetera. So we're very proud to have those resources available to share with the community here. On the safety front, we continue to advance our STEP initiative, Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian. We're currently working with over 30 states to address pedestrian safety, providing training technical assistance. Yesterday, you heard about our bikeway selection guide. The good news is a lot of people in the room knew about it, but not many people are using it yet, so we have more work to do there to help support you. It's a resource to help practitioners consider and make informed decisions about the trade-offs relating to the selection of bikeway types. We have an ongoing pooled fund study called Fostering Innovation in Pedestrian Bike Transportation. 13 states and DC are involved. We're about ready to finish two projects that examine the safety performance of curb ball vouts and green paint intersection treatments. Other state, local agencies, and private companies are invited to participate in this effort. On the funding side, we recently looked at how money was spent, federal aid money was spent in fiscal year 2018. States obligated 916 million in federal aid highway program funds for pedestrian and bicycle programs and projects. This represents 2.3% of all federal aid highway funding. I'm just giving you the facts on that. Coming soon from our agency, uh, Rails with Trails, Lessons Learned, describes some of the effective practices to plan, design, construct, operate, and maintain rail with trail facilities. Also, we have a new course coming out from the National Highway Institute. It's a bicycle, it will be a web-based bicycle, faci uh, bicycle facility design course. And as you know, we keep hearing about micromobility. Our agency, I feel like we're behind because this field is emerging so quickly, but the good news is we do have some work that we're starting that's on, and it's also ongoing to look at how to incorporate micromobility into Federal Highway Administration's programs. We're in the process of interviewing practitioners around the country right now in understanding how they're operating, planning, designing for scooters and all the other devices that we've seen. <clears throat> 